Good morning, everyone. I'm so excited to be here to share a story of mine that started many, many years ago. And to start this off with, I would first like to tell you a little bit about where I come from. As you said, I'm from Minnesota, and if any of you know where Minnesota is, it's right at the very top of the United States, right next to Canada. So everything is just very cold there all the time. So just to be able to be invited here to get out of the cold is always a good thing. I'm a professor of learning technologies, and I run the Learning Technologies Media Lab at the University of Minnesota. And in learning technologies, one thing that we try to do is focus on how we can use technology in innovative ways and do things that no one else has done before. We focus on designing numerous experiences. We talk about how we can look at integration in a new way. And my direct focus is in online learning. What we're trying to do at the Learning Technologies Media Lab is where we are designing experiences and not products. This lab just opened a year ago, and it was a lab that we had been working on for about a decade. And now we're at a point where we can move forward and deliver a new type of education. And this new type of education is what I'm here to share with you today. This picture of me coming through the past is actually in the Canadian Arctic, in the Baffin Island. And as I was traveling through the past here, I quickly realized that my dream had become a reality. This dream was to deliver education in a new way to K-12 edu ed educators and students around the world. I wanted students to experience something that they had never experienced before. I myself was a K-12 teacher, and I was teaching geography, and I was using a textbook that was 10 years old, I was trying to get my students excited. I thought I was a good teacher, but they weren't excited. And I thought to myself, why can't I get my students excited about bringing the real world into the classroom? Why aren't we doing this? And this is about 10 years ago. At the same point, I knew, I knew that the world was changing, and the world was changing very quickly. No matter where you stand, I can tell you that where I traveled 10 years ago, I can't travel today by dog sled because the ice is gone. And so no matter where you stand on it politically, I had this passion for it, and I wanted to bring this to the world so that students can make a decision for themselves. I wanted students to look like this. This is an actual picture of students in California using one of my adventure learning projects. I wanted students to be excited and motivated about learning. In other words, I wanted to create change. I didn't want to simply respond to it. As we look at how technology is used throughout education, we know that we normally respond to something rather than creating it ourselves and making a difference in a way that we would like to see it. And unfortunately, Many people believe this cannot happen in education because we know we're so busy, we're overworked, we don't have access to resources, but I'm here today to tell you that I believe it can happen and it will continue to happen. And with this comes a story that started back in 2000, actually started before 2004, but 2004 was the first year when I started to do this. And it's an approach to online learning called adventure learning where I'm working to get students excited and motivated. And here's a little intro to that. I'm Aaron Deering from the U of M. To truly understand our impact on the natural world, you have to experience it firsthand. So this is my classroom. Students from around the world join our team online as we research climate change in the Arctic. Together, we learn about our environment and how our actions can make a difference. So the search continues. So in 30 seconds, that gave you a little bit of an overview about adventure learning. That was a little commercial the University of Minnesota put together a couple years ago. And adventure learning is grounded in theory, 
I'm not going to talk to you about that theory today and bore you, but I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of how I go about delivering such a thing. The first thing we do is we focus on an issue in a place. I identify an issue, it might be oil drilling in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge and the people within this region, be it the Chukchi, the Yupik, or the Inuit. I then think about what is it that I want students to learn from our experiences out there. So we write an entire curriculum that students can integrate within their classroom and teachers can integrate within their classroom. I also think about how it is that we can tie this to an adventure. So we have this issue in place, we have the curriculum, and now what is the adventure that is going to get students excited about learning? As we know, we all want to be a part of an adventure. We'd like to see the beginning, the heightened experience, and the end, and we want to become part of it. We think about how we can bring all these things together in a sync learning approach, where we have all the media, we have all the curriculum, we have the adventure, and students can see this together. So we're actually out there in the field collecting these media artifacts, doing the interviews with the elders if we're focused on climate change, and this is all synced to the curriculum that they're using within the classroom. And the last thing we know that teachers have is time. And we also provide them with pedagogical guidelines on how they can integrate it within the classroom. And we think about how we can bring this together so that students and teachers and experts can learn together in a way they have not learned before. And we do this all through delivering it via the internet so it truly is available to all learners throughout the world. In 2004, I launched what was called Arctic Transect 2004. And we traveled across the area of Nunavut in Canada. We traveled for six months by dog sled with an average temperature of 40 below. And as we did this, we delivered our education experience to the students around the world. So truly, when we were taking an education day on Friday and getting this out to students so they could see it on Monday morning, they were experiencing it along with us as they were learning from the curriculum. As I hit the north end of the Baffin Island, very close to Greenland, I quickly realized that we had over, mil we had over three million students that had used the project that year. And I said, we need to continue to do this, and we need to continue to bring, the, especially the circumpolar Arctic, to students around the world. And then from, from that, Go North was born. Go North is a circumpolar project where we actually traveled around the entire circumpolar Arctic. So in 2006, we traveled to Alaska, focused on the Gwich'in and the Nupiat in oil drilling. In 2007, I traveled to Chukotka, Russia. And as I traveled across this region, we focused on mineral exploration and spent time with the Chukchi in the Yupik, that is 80 miles across the Bering Strait. In 2008, we traveled to an area known as Fennoscania of Norway, Sweden, and Finland. And as we traveled through this area, spending time with the Sami and focused on deforestation. And in 2009, I went back to one of my favorite places, Nunavut. And Nunavut is three sizes the size of Texas, with only 73, road, 73 miles of roads, and none of them are interconnected. And in 2010, I traveled across Greenland by dog sled. And that was the entire Go North Adventure Learning Project. So we traveled the entire circumpolar Arctic by dog sled, delivering this education to students worldwide. And when I was up in the Arctic, I quickly also realized that there was a disconnect between education and sustainability. This was before sustainability was such a buzzword. And what we found out was that the way the students were being educated and what they needed to understand to sustain themselves on the land, to speak to the elders, that there was a complete disconnect. The curriculum that was being used did not reinforce their culture, it did not reinforce their language. And thus, I launched another project called Education. And Education is where we actually are traveling to all seven continents over the next four years in order to do research on education and sustainability. So we've already traveled to Burkina Faso in Africa. 
We traveled to northern Norway, starting in Tromsø and making our way down the, the coast. And I just returned from Australia, where we spent weeks traveling literally throughout that continent doing interviews. And now we're quickly off to South America this fall, and we'll finish up at the North Pole, excuse me, at the South Pole in 2014. The impact of these projects have been great to date, with over 15 million students, 3,000 classrooms, and people on six continents using the project. The real question, just like I've said this morning, is why does this work? Why is it that students in the classroom are being motivated? Why is it that teachers are excited about it? And that's what I'm here to tell you, to hopefully guide the way that you design learning environments and the way that you do something that can do something different within the classroom. The first thing is the power of the story. Just like I took this photo here in Chukotka in Russia, as I sat down with these elders, I realized this is what was motivating the students. And what I'd like to do is give you a little snippet of what it's like to sit down with these elders around the world and collect the story that I'm sharing with you here. So here is an interview with an elder just outside of Ouagadougou in Burkina Faso, Africa. And it doesn't matter if we are in Africa or we go all the way to the Arctic, the elders and what they have to say is very similar. And here is an elder from the Arctic in Alaska. Up here in the Arctic village, life is a little bit different than elsewhere because uh, uh, there's, there's no major river like the Yukon where barges and stuff like that can travel. Uh, the only way that you can get here is by air, mainly by air. We do really depend on this caribou herd for, mainly for food. And if they develop oil up in Anwar, and the caribou decide to move somewhere else, we ne may never see it again. So this elder is talking about how bringing oil drilling into this region can impact their culture. And as he's telling this story, we're sharing it with students around the world as they're studying from the curriculum that reinforces the same thing. And I just returned from Australia. And we traveled starting in Sydney, all the way up to Arnhem Land, over to the East Coast, off into the bush. And here's an interview with one of my favorite elders from the Arnhem Land region, which you may have read about, an Australian Aborigine. Study about your language. If you come around to Arnhem Land of Australia, with the Northern Territory, you're learning to my language. Important thing is, so that you can understand my language, my background, where I came from. And you are learning about me. I was learning about you. Understand one another, we can develop the country, wealthy country. And these are the stories that need to be shared. I always say that the only reason I get invited out to have a drink is because I have these stories from around the world. And so I decided that I would share with you one of my favorite stories that I share. And this was actually the first day out on a six-month expedition by dog sled across the Canadian Arctic. And as you'll quickly see, we had a little bit of a problem. Paul and I were on the front sled, and we had been traveling like that for uh, the, the first two days. And we had traveled over a number of leads, um, lead being a, a break in the ice that had to be frozen. And we had no problem traveling over them. They were all frozen, and we uh, really didn't think much of it. Well, out on the Great Slave Lake then, we were traveling, and as the dogs went across, the front of the sled went across, and all of a sudden we heard a crack, and as I looked down, I saw the sled going down. Um, I, 
just, I don't know, I don't know why I did it or how I did it, but I just literally leaped. I learned that I can uh, fly today. <laughs> As uh, the flight of my skis going down, I leaped forward and everything, thank goodness, worked out just fine. And uh, we lashed back on and we're warm again. And that is actually just a normal day in Minnesota. That's what it looks like. I'm joking. <laughs> And this is one of our dogs, and this is one of our dogs, and his name was Goody. And the reason I show Goody is because one of the things that we did in our online learning environment is that we shared what was happening based on the perspective of one of our dogs. And so every Wednesday in the tent, I literally type up what was happening from the perspective of this dog. And that year, the dog's name was Timber. And so we had what was called Timber Tales. And you would think that would be very simple. But the students absolutely loved it. It was the most visited area of the website. After traveling for six months, we returned to the Minneapolis International Airport. As I came down the escalator, this is what I saw. I saw that Timber was running for president. And this is exactly what reinforces this idea of the power of the story. That the students wanted to be part of the story. In fact, in 2006, we finished the expedition on the north end of Alaska and we never said goodbye to our students around the world and we heard from hundreds of, of teachers that said you know what we were part of the story and you didn't say goodbye and so every year thereafter we then shared not only the end of our story but let the students share their story online so it's not only the, the power of the story it's the community it's a reason that we are here today it's the it's where all of our stories intersect with one another and literally for over a decade, we've been saying we can do this in online learning. But have we achieved it? We're getting there, but we have a long ways to go. And what I wanted to see happen is where students, teachers, and experts could intersect with one another and discuss all these issues online. So what we decided to do at the Media Lab is design what we call the Enviro Network. And this Enviro Network, or what's called Enviro Wall, is where literally students and teachers elders from around the world can share their stories through a video and so I will give you a, a website address at the end so you can actually go online and share your perspective of what is education and what is sustainability and here's one of the stories and an overview of the Enviro Network. So as you see here anyone from around the world can go on and they can click on one of the stories and here is a Inuit elder. As ourselves Inuit will have to eventually adapt to the changes as well, like all animals do. Animals, as war was built, animals have adapt to different changes, like all, same as humans will. So just as Charlie shared his perspective, you can go online and share your perspective. We wanted to see that students would interact in a way that was more than a discussion board, that they could actually go online, <laughs> capture it, with the computer and share their perspective. And we do this in many of our classes at the Media Lab. The other thing that we're told to do is to bring real world issues into the classroom. We said that's what's going to motivate students. That's what's going to excite teachers. But how are we going to actually do this? This is a picture from Burkina Faso. As we visited the, these villages, we saw these students sitting in their rows sharing their perspective. And we said, how do we get this out in a way that we did this in the Arctic? And that's exactly what we do. In the Arctic, I sat in a tent like this at what was called Education Day for me. It was on a Friday. And I sent all the media that we collected, the videos, the audio, everything that corresponded with the curriculum to what we call base camp to be available for students worldwide on Monday morning. In Africa, this is my colleague, Dr. Charles Miller and I, and we're sitting there with a BGAN internet system, meaning that it's a broadband global area network. So anywhere in the world, just about everywhere in the world, we can get access to the internet and we can share these real world issues and the data that we're collecting worldwide. Here I am in the Arctic and we're doing actually snow water equivalent testing with the Inuit students. And as I'm collecting this data, I'm sharing it real time with students worldwide who are actually doing the data collection themselves. I just returned from Australia, and now what we're able to do is actually collect this media 
at night, we're actually editing that media and we get it online that same day. And here is a perspective from a rancher out in the bush and the challenges he has with sustainability. By sustaining those high cattle numbers on the landscape when we had very poor seasons was when we saw a lot of the degradation occur, erosion, loss of species, um, oh, loss of species to diversification. So as you see the Australian Aborigines in the north sharing their perspective, we have Roger Landsberg sharing his perspective, and we're doing this all online in an environment that looks like this. So for every single new expedition or every single project, students can then go online and they can select either the daily or the weekly update. Teachers can go online, they can select the curriculum that corresponds with it, and together we are able to learn in a way that we haven't been able to learn before. So this is a trail report, as we call it, or a field report. So truly what students are doing is that they're seeing what we experience, our interviews, our data collection that corresponds with the curriculum. We all say that we want to create transformational learning experiences. My goal with Adventure Learning is to create an approach that is not based on age, race, or wealth. I wanted to see that students from around the world could do the same thing that we were doing. In fact, a criticism that I would get when sharing Adventure Learning was many times, well, you have to have a lot of money. Not every crazy character is going to want to go and travel to these places around the world. And so I took that to heart. And we are now working on what I talk about as Adventure Learning 2.0. And I know you can't see it from where you're sitting, but on the very left-hand side is the theoretical construct of Adventure Learning. And we took that and developed these principles that can be put into action by the learners themselves and by teachers themselves in their own community. Thus creating a community of learners where we have educators, we have experts, and we have students interacting together around the same issue. And fortunately, with the funding of grants, the first approach is what we call Explore 15. And so literally all these environments you are able to use yourself. Explore 15 is where students and teachers from around the world can go online and they can identify a local issue. You could do it in Barcelona. You can identify what the issues are here. Go out, do interviews, collect media, and you will then be able to share this worldwide, be it with your iPad, your iPhone, or any web browser. And this is a mock-up of the environment, and this will be launched in the fall. Another project that we're doing, again, in order to take adventure learning to the next level, is in students, what I call a project north of 60. I always had an issue with, student, with people asking me about the changing Arctic because I'm really not the expert in the Arctic. Who is the expert in the Arctic? It's the students and the people that actually live there. And so I created this project called North of 60. And within this project, the students are going out and interviewing their elders. They're doing the data collection. And they are then being able to share that immediately online. And this project will also launch in the fall. As you can imagine, traveling around the world, there are many, many stories, there are many beautiful happenings, beautiful photos, and beautiful people. And to put this all together in a 25-minute talk is very difficult, so what I thought I would do is put a little photo montage together to give you a little glimpse of what adventure learning has meant to me. I'm not going to do it. 
Thank you. 